Welcome back. This lecture covers the National Security Agency's program of collecting bulk domestic email metadata. It's one of the lesser known bulk surveillance programs, and it was brought to a close in 2011. I'm beginning with it because it was one of the earliest domestic bulk programs with roots in late 2001, and it was the first domestic bulk surveillance program to be approved by the FISC. I'd like to take the program in three parts. First, I'll explain the technology involved. Then, I'll sketch the procedure the NSA analysts had to follow to access the data. Finally, I'll touch on the legality of the program. So, to begin, the technology. And it's really quite straightforward. Suppose that Alice is sending an email to Bob. She starts by drafting the email. Then, when she sends it, her computer passes along the email to her email provider. Her email provider, in turn, passes the message to Bob's email provider over the public internet. And finally, Bob gets the email. Now let me explain the exact same steps, but with more technical precision. When Alice sends an email, she might use one of two common protocols, HTTP or SMTP. HTTP would be webmail, and SMTP would be a more traditional email client. Then, SMTP gets used to move the data between Alice's email provider and Bob's email provider. Finally, Bob might retrieve the email with HTTP, POP, or IMAP. HTTP, again, reflects webmail, and POP and IMAP are protocols used by conventional mail apps. For quite some time, the connection between Alice and her email provider has been routinely encrypted and authenticated. The same goes for the connection between Bob and his provider. Until roughly 2014, however, most connections between email providers were not encrypted. These days, I should note, most consumer email providers do encrypt their traffic. A number of marketing email services still don't, though. OK, so the NSA clued into this. And it began surveilling email traffic as it moved across the internet in bulk. Here's an example snippet of SMTP traffic. Don't worry about the technical details. All I'd like to emphasize is that it's pretty readable. And it's pretty easy to pick out message metadata. The fields are right there. So, from about 2001 to 2011, the National Security Agency collected just this sort of message metadata on emails within the United States. So, there's the technology associated with the NSA's bulk domestic email metadata program. Now let's turn to the internal procedures associated with the program. And I should note that this is the procedure established by FISC orders beginning in 2004. The procedure appears to have been different when it was a solely executive program. All right, so targeting for this program required reasonable, articulable suspicion of affiliation with a terrorist organization. Here's my understanding of how it worked, with the caveats that I'm slightly simplifying and slightly borrowing from what's known about the phone metadata program, since there's been more disclosed about that. Email metadata flowed in, in bulk, from collection points on the domestic internet backbone. That raw metadata was stored in an access-controlled database for about a rolling five-year period. Technicians could look it over to make sure systems were functioning properly, but ordinary analysts couldn't access the data. Separately, analysts suggested targeting criteria for the collected metadata. Specifically, they picked out email addresses and similar so-called selectors with reasonable, articulable suspicion of affiliation with terrorist groups. After some internal review, those targeting criteria were saved in another database. It was called the station table. Go figure. The raw data got checked against the targeting criteria in the station table. 
metadata up to two or three hops away from the target was moved into yet another database. I'll return to this notion of hops in a moment. The new database in NSA lingo was the corporate store. You really can't make this stuff up. Within the corporate store, analysts could pour over the email metadata, and they could distribute what they learned in accordance with some minimization procedures. I want to emphasize a part of this process that is incredibly important and incredibly subtle. When first selecting targeting criteria, analysts were limited to counterterrorism investigations, and they needed reasonable, articulable suspicion. However, once data was in the corporate store, it appears to have been fair game for any foreign intelligence purpose, and analysts didn't need to satisfy the reasonable, articulable suspicion standard, or even the relevance standard. Put differently, the privacy impact of the program depended substantially on the size of the corporate store. That's the information that analysts could more routinely access. And the size of the corporate store, in turn, depended substantially on the NSA's so-called contact chaining procedure. Let me explain how that worked. Suppose Alice emailed Bob, who emailed Charlie, who emailed Dave. And imagine that Alice is a target in the metadata surveillance program. In NSA jargon, Alice's email address would be the seed query. Bob would be one hop away. Charlie would be two hops away. And Dave would be three hops away. After targeting Alice, the NSA would not just have access to Alice's email metadata. It would also have access to Bob's and Charlie's and Dave's. And that's just one path for contact chaining. Alice has presumably emailed with lots of other people, as has Bob, and Charlie, and Dave too. So, with contact chaining, it's easy to see how a single target can exponentially grow into a huge data set. It's a lot like the old six degrees of Kevin Bacon problem. And maybe the data set is even larger what about popular email addresses, like shipping notifications from Amazon.com? It's not clear how the NSA handled these. Orders from the FISC certainly didn't prohibit that sort of hop, which could reach a huge proportion of the entire American population. In fact, when FISC judges allowed NSA technicians to search through the raw data for popular addresses, they viewed that as a concession to the NSA, not as a privacy protection. A charitable view on this issue is that, as a matter of internal practice, the NSA ignored these popular email addresses when building the corporate store. Another, more cynical view is that the NSA only ignored these addresses when analysts queried the corporate store. In other words, the NSA may have used these addresses to maximize the amount of information subject to lesser constraints. There is, unfortunately, no public information that definitively supports one or the other of these views. Since that was a little in the weeds, let me put it differently. It is entirely possible that the corporate store contained a sizable share of all domestic email metadata. And remember that the corporate store could be queried for any foreign intelligence purpose, and there was no requirement of reasonable, articulable suspicion of anything. So, some critics of this program have emphasized that the corporate store was a massive loophole. And even if the NSA wasn't yet taking advantage of that loophole, it could start at any time. All right, enough on the procedure associated with the program. Now on to the last subject, legal issues. As I mentioned, the program's roots date back to 2001, following the September 11th attacks. 
the executive branch asserted inherent Article II authority to conduct the program, and major telecom services provided access to their backbone networks. In 2004, however, a Department of Justice review concluded that the program was inconsistent with FISA and ECPA. After a showdown within the executive branch, the program was transitioned to FISA court oversight. I hope you recall from the material on FISA pen trap orders that Judge Kolar Kotelli approved this program in 2004. This was really a stretch from the text of the FISA pen trap provisions. In particular, all this procedure about reasonable articulable suspicion and raw data and a station table and a corporate store, it's nowhere to be found in FISA. So, periodically, the NSA got a pen trap order for each internet backbone provider involved in the program. It served those orders on the internet services, and they allowed the NSA to access bulk email metadata. Specifically, they allowed the NSA to attach hardware interception devices to their networks, and the NSA could remotely configure those devices as necessary. The program had a rocky history of compliance issues. In this context, compliance issue is the NSA euphemism for violating a court order. I'd like to highlight a few. Perhaps the greatest issue was massive overcollection of data, seemingly including content. The agency repeatedly told the FISC that it hadn't overcollected data, and an audit for the FISC concluded that it hadn't overcollected data. Then, it turned out that was all wrong. The episode was very embarrassing for the NSA, and FISC judges were certainly displeased. Another compliance issue involved the process of querying raw email metadata. Remember how that required reasonable, articulable suspicion? Well, the agency had been making automated queries of the raw data without RAS. Yet another issue was internal dissemination of email metadata without explaining to the FISC how that would happen. And finally, the NSA shared data from the program with other federal agencies, including the FBI, without the required minimization review. I think it's fair to say this was a really troubled program. And again, the NSA allowed it to lapse in 2011 following a set of compliance debacles. The last point I'd like to address on the legality of this program is, does it comply with the Fourth Amendment? One view is that this is all metadata, so it's covered by the third party doctrine. If one person's metadata isn't protected, then bulk metadata isn't protected. In other words, zero protection plus zero protection equals zero protection. That's certainly the view of the executive branch and of the FISA court. Another view is that there's something constitutionally different about this sort of bulk surveillance, perhaps because of the quantity of information or the duration it's retained. One district court judge bought this view in the context of a challenge to the analogous phone metadata program. All right, that brings to a close what I wanted to cover on legal issues surrounding this program. In the next lecture, I'm going to explain the NSA's bulk domestic phone metadata program. It's very similar.